So I'm here talking with one of the sensations of the director's Fortnite 2013, uh, Blue Ruin filmmaker, director, Jeremy Solner. Solnier. Solnier. Um, who we used to reference as Matt Portenfield's um, DP, but now we reference as the director who brought us Blue Ruin, your sophomore film. Between Murder Party and Blue Ruin, what, what, what was the gestation process like? And then perhaps take us into, not the genesis of the film, but the little nugget that started, where you pissed off at a neighbor or something. Like, how did, how, what was the first kernel? <laughs> yeah, Murder Party is, is near and dear to me. I, it was a, my first film. I just set an arbitrary deadline of, I'm turning 30, I need to make a movie. I've never made a feature, and now is the time. And I did, and I cast my high school friends to play it safe. I stayed in the horror genre, it's a without name cast. Um, the easiest way to sell your film is keep it genre. Absolutely. And, and I, I do love genre film. Um, and I thought I didn't quite have enough money or time to make it legitimately scary. So I made it a comedy as well. Okay. Um, so that film did quite well at festivals and won the Slam Dance Audience Award. And South by Southwest and a bunch of others and sold in Magnolia which is a coup for that small film mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, I was you know very proud of the work got offered a few scripts and they were all sleazy horror comedies of I course didn't quite respond to them of course and I realized I had put myself in this pretty you know well self-designed pigeonhole and couldn't get out of it and I work in advertising, I, I, I do corporate videos, and I make a good living, not a charity case by any stretch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I just went back to that. Uh, the scripts I were, was given uh, were great, and I didn't have anything ready to go. So I kind of dropped off the radar for quite some time. I always thought of myself as a director, but I love the camera. And so two years later, I realized I had gone so far um, off course that I got to get back in there and filmmaking. Mm -hmm. so I started working as a, a cinematographer. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a blast doing it. And I shot four films in the course of the uh, We're, we're very thankful that you shot Putty Hill and I Used to Be Darker. Yes. We're very thankful that, yeah. Yeah, I shot Matt's first film, Hamilton, but it wasn't until Putty Hill where I finally was able to, to, to showcase my, my talents as a cinematographer and uh -huh. not have any disclaimers or like, eh, we only had 11 shooting days or like, oh, we used a camera that wasn't quite up to par. I was like, I was like wow, like, I'm proud of this. And Matt, Matt killed it and I, I served him well and I uh -huh. was very proud. Um, and that was a great huge step and that got me out there as a cinematographer. I was getting calls, I was working uh, in the indie world. Uh, sub million dollar level so I wasn't paying the bills but it was it was restoring some of the soul that was sucked out by of course. advertising of course and um then I got the itch to do my own film and I, I've been watching my directors their triumphs their failures everything and learning waiting watching mm -hmm. and I started to, to design a, a workaround a workaround the 18 day schedules no matter what the film is it's always three six day weeks a workaround you know, really trying hard, overreaching for a name cast. We weren't quite into the film, mm -hmm. we dedicated to the process, and would ultimately make the film suffer as a result. And I, I, I sort of, and it was a deliberate shift away from Murder Party. It's like the next film I do is going to be nothing like Murder Party. It's going to, it's going to redefine myself as a filmmaker, and showcase whatever I have. And I had the biggest resource I had was my, my best friend, Megan Blair, as an actor. And I designed the entire project around him. I told him, yeah, you're going to be in a revenge film, but you're going to be the lead. And he's like, whoa, have you taken a look at me, man? <laughs> uh, I can't quite carry that. Was he clean-shaven when you when you know him as clean-shaven? Yeah. Okay. He's, he's, he's had a short beard here. Okay. There, but it was always this beach bum concept that I had been for the last, you know, for about a year before. I was like, I had several ideas, like, well, there's a beach, a beach bum movie was it going to be a comedy, then sort of the premise I'd come up with was sort of taken by another, uh, some trade announcement that made okay. it. Okay. Emailed me, I said, fuck that. We're going to get simple. We're going to just keep the genre. We're going to design it so it serves us and serves the audience. And no one's going to steal our idea. It's the most generic American uh -huh. scenario out there. But we're going to keep that to, to one act. And then the rest of the film is going to be an exploration of what happens 
after your your very sort of clean and cut revenge film ends, which is just like dreadful, flailing. And revenge films are the most boring subgenre that that I can think of because yeah. it's been overdone to death. You just wait for someone to get killed and then. You, you like either celebrate or you just you walk away. It's, yes. It's done. I mean, you had films like Unforgiven, which was a new, a new take. Uh huh. But still, across the board, it's always been a badass. Ex military, you know, the, the old prison killer, whatever it is. They all know what they're doing. And I thought it'd be much more fun to explore someone doing this scenario, but having I mean, no, uh, no clue yeah. how to operate, no, no background. You know, he's got mean. the emotion, but he doesn't have the preconceived notions of how he's going to yeah. go about it. He's a dunce. I mean, he's a total giddy at what he does. I mean, he's a sweetheart, and um, and so making was just was like, okay, oh, so I get to, oh yeah, sure, I can do that. Okay. And um, and then you know, there's there's locations that we used that um were at our disposal. The Cleveland house, there's a, a finale at the end. That's Macon's uh-huh. cousin's property in Central Virginia. A night invasion sequence with you know some shotguns and crossbows. That that is my childhood home, and that scene was written from the very beginning, blocked out shot for shot from my home. And we tried to, for our own sake, while we were shooting in Charlottesville, which is about an hour and a half from my childhood home, okay, to find that house elsewhere. And then we just stopped. I said, stop the search. Like it's it's gonna be easy on us to, to, to not have to move trucks, but like. This, this this scene was designed for this house. We're gonna travel up the highway and replant and shoot here, and it worked out really well. Um, so yeah, it was, it was basically a, an attempt to redefine my tastes and, and, and share them with, with, with the whole new audience. And being here is a whole other. It's rare where where I'll actually physically um, where my response to the film will be the one that's kind of being lived by the character on screen. Um, there's something that happens to your lead, and I automatically had both hands hovering over that place. And I'm, and I'm a trained cinephile, right? I shouldn't be doing those things, <laughs> but it just gives you an idea of the gut react, like the the spirit and the atmospherics, and like how strong a sense you had in in developing, um, yeah, atmosphere, the tonality of the film. I refer to it as a nouveau blood simple, and, a lo- and I happened to f- come across somebody else who said this exact same thing. What were your, what were your influences in, in not not necessarily the the dark matière, but how you arrived to getting such a, a strong control of the pacing? Having having familiarity with locations really helped. Like again, mm-hmm. blocking that one scene out from the home, I grew up in mm-hmm. every inch, every corner, and I, I, I'm definitely a visual thinker. From the very beginning, when I when I write the script, it's it's literally imprinted in my brain how it's going to be shot. Which okay. is how I think. So, and as a cinematographer, there's no translation issue there. I, mm-hmm. I, I write it as I want it. I direct it how I want it. I shoot it how I want it. And it's it's very liberating, especially for the the more atmospheric, quiet visual sequences. However, I I, I have noticed that you know serving as my own cinematographer is like a total go fuck when it comes to intense dialogue scenes. I'm, I'm operating the camera, I'm worried about, you know, headroom yeah. and, and, uh, and framing and these actors are just giving me their all and I, I just, I can't remember what I just said. Uh, I had three notes and uh, this is another take, you know, it's like, but, but it was designed very, very um, deliberately mm-hmm. all the way through. I storyboard intensely. The opening 20 minutes are like meticulously storyboarded, shaded, colored mm-hmm. pieces of art, and then by the end of the film, it's like chicken scratch and, and uh, stick figures. Yeah. But as far as atmosphere, I mean, I, I really, it's so intuitive that I, I, I'm not like a cerebral filmmaker, I'm like a more really visceral one. I just, I'm tired of, uh, of, of films that sort of indulge and, and, and explore things and challenge you on purpose uh-huh. um, and, and don't entertain. But as far as atmosphere, I just a visual thinker and I can't quite articulate what it is, but I, 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 I love structure. I love making every single thing in the film purposeful. Every shot has a reason. Um, and if it doesn't, it gets cut out of the film. And did you, like, like you, I remember, I think it was, uh, you had said that you had just 
completed like color uh, the, the color like the week before something crazy like that you had just submitted it and then you actually sit down and see with an audience for the first time are you are you like are you all giddy because they're they're laughing at I mean this is quite it's a quite it's quite funny in this sardonic crazy way and, and I, I think this is the one of the beauties of the film is that, is that yeah there is this noir humor to it but when you're watching it there with an audience they're totally getting the spot I mean that must be that must be so much fun for you as a yeah yeah okay. a communal absolutely and there's you know there's festival like Kool-Aid screenings where everyone gets it they all drink Kool-Aid yes and this is one of them yes I mean it was it Jimmy was, Jones was uh, not Jimmy <laughs> Jones but it was the Jonestown at the end it was basically it, it was such a uh, a perfect reaction that I, I vowed like never to watch it again in the audience. Cause I, I've been to some screenings at festivals where it's just murder, it's perfect synergy, and then other uh, times it's just yeah. like, awful, nothing. So um, it was so gratifying because I, I saw the world premiere was the first time I'd ever seen the film mm -hmm. uh, in its entirety with married picture and sound, and, and, and we didn't ever really expect to get here. We used this as an arbitrary deadline. Uh, Oh, our edit sort of stalled out. What are we going to do? Okay. Uh, let's just, uh, uh, next biggie is can. Let's go for that. We'll do four weeks on. We submitted a first cut, kind of high five. And like, like, let's regroup for September. We're going to show Sundance in 2014. You know, we'll see if we can get in. And we asked Fortnite because we were like, you know, <coughs> there's five weeks left until we have to finish this. It was, so basically, we were bugging Fortnite for a date of notification, not one way or the other. And there maybe was a translation error, whatever. But they were very cryptic, and very positive about our film. Like, oh, we, we don't, we don't want to hear that. Like, it's exciting that you like the film, but we just want to know if we were to be accepted or not. Uh -huh. When would we know? And we, four times we asked them, never got an answer. And the fourth time they were like, "You're invited. Come on." So it, we had about a month to get to picture lock and finalize the edit and start sound and start visual effects so if we were totally not wow. presuming to be in here but nothing is better than a real hardcore target a deadline to, um, and to get to, your to kick your, your yeah ass. get your ass uh, yeah so I mean we mixed we mixed this film in three days and we were literally standing up like you know like it was a workout we're calling out sound effects like we had this guy Corey Melius at Bird City just like Standing up behind the just big, big mm -hmm. live mixing almost. Mm -hmm. we, we only watched it down once before I made a few fixes and they shipped it. We had no time to Great think score, it. by the way, off topic. Great score. The score was awesome. Yeah, it well, is uh, my, my lead actor's little brothers in Philadelphia, and they are so talented. Um, they're not the most experienced with Pro Tools, but I just tapped them. I mean, they, they did Murder Party as well. Okay. And there are these insanely talented kids out of Philadelphia. Oh, that's cool. And they're like, well, not any longer. Well, they're my no. little secret. And they uh, they really came through, and the score was done in a matter of a week. I went down for two visits, and they worked in between, and we just cranked it out to the wee hours, and barely made it. I don't think there's too many Kickstarter projects in Cannes this year. I, it's probably the only one, if I had to put money on it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely been... Um, it, it's helped a lot as, like, both... Uh, a long lead sort of publicity campaign, and uh, I think it, that's what. Well, that's the that's the first I heard of the project yeah. because because I had recognized the name. I said, Jeremy, this is the dude that yeah. And I mean, we use Kickstarter. I think as it's intended, it was literally a Kickstarter. Uh -huh. It's actually a, a fraction of the budget, but we we funded it in steps. I had submitted the script. Uh, through a niche South Johnny at Film Science who had full faith in the project but couldn't get investors to come on board because well, what are we going to show them? Murder Party. And I, I, st I, tell, I told him like just don't even send my DVD just let's be in the script and pretend I'm a first time uh -huh, filmmaker. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Because I, I, didn't, I love Murder Party but it's, it's low rent it's standard definition yeah. video it's like it's not what I want to present. And um, no investors would come on board some wanted to and said you guys can't pull it off that budget just can't do it. Like, we don't even know what the budget is. Like, let's let's talk about that. Anyways, there's no time. My, my third child was on the way. I knew I had a very, very short window uh -huh. to make it. was like within four months, I had to, this film was going to be either made or it would never exist. So, um, Kickstarter 
allowed my UPM to approve the green light because okay. he said, if you don't have the cash on hand in the bank yeah. to make a payroll, you're not making a movie. And I was like, okay. Uh, because I was like, I have credit cards. I'll max them all out. My American Express Platinum has no limits. And I put a quarter million dollars on that, just alone. My wife and I. My wife emptied her retirement account. I emptied mine. And so it was, it was not a cheap movie, but the, the Kickstarter infusion literally allowed us to greenlight the film mm -hmm. and make payroll for the, for the four weeks of production. And so, yeah, I mean, and it's, it's been great. I mean, it showcases like when no one will take the leap of faith with you, you can you can literally look to other people. And I was a skeptic at first. I was like, film filmmaking is a for profit endeavor. I just don't like it. I don't uh -huh. I don't want to ask people for money so I can. Uh, I intend to make money off this film. Um, and then I was it Matt that I pitched you the idea? Was it? Was well, it? Matt was so successful in this campaign. Yeah. I was like, you know, no one's throwing money at us, independent filmmakers, and, and, and it's, it was like, you know, I was sort of first to it, but um, I started giving to a few campaigns, and I realized it's like it's five bucks or a hundred bucks, whatever I want to give, I give, and no one's forcing me to. So, sure, I reached out, and I, and I, and I really felt confident in the project, and I felt finally like, yeah, you, you should. Give me some money, and I, I promise to deliver you. It's okay to ask team. sometimes for favors, yeah. to, even to complete strangers. Yeah. Um, the response has been so good on uh, after the premiere that uh, Radius just came in, swooped in, picked up the rights. Yeah. So congratulations on that. Thank you. That must be like further validation that you did something right on your second time out. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm very proud of the film, especially I didn't have time to blink. I just. I watched, we were actually in negotiations uh, in, in the morning, and I, I was like, listen, I'm not trying to play hardball, it's not leverage or anything, mm -hmm. but I need to watch my film before I sell my film. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. So I went to the real premiere, and it was, it was a dream. I mean, the reception was amazing. Um, they put the spotlight on you, and you just... Yeah. And no Q and A, no pressure. Yeah. We walked out, and I was pulled into a sales meeting. And intense negotiations ensued. Great. So you signed that somewhere at four, 4 a.m. in the morning or something. But it was even early. It was so quick. Wow. Wow. I mean, and uh, we we got out of the theater at like what, seven. I don't know. And then we were sold by nine. That's pretty cool. I mean, you're going to be following up uh, after uh, what? Only God forgives. I think is our next title. So that's yeah. yeah. It's pretty cool to belong yeah. to that that house. It's it's, it's been such a warm reception and. and, and and things I only dreamed about are taking place. Well, and congratulations. I, yeah. And I, I feel almost guilty for it. It's like, you know, no, no, no. Premier, sales meeting, you know, champagne toast to like a very, very generous. You worked hard and, 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 it, and it shows. It really, like, yeah, yeah I, I automatically gravitated to this film within the first couple of instances, first couple of scenes, and I'm like, Thank you. yeah. yeah. And, I mean, and being here is a, is a different ballgame as far as you know, the international stakes are, are way different now. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. By being at, at Fortnite, it, it all of a sudden, our foreign territories are, are really interested in, in yeah, like, producing the film. Like Taiwan, and all of a sudden. Yeah. Or, or, we were like, already got yeah. dumped in weird territories, and I know what happened to it. Yeah, exactly, this but now... Is, this is a, it legitimizes the film and myself, and now I'm just terrified i got to make a, another film that's got to be good. <laughs> Well, let's soak into this one a little bit. Uh, yeah, have fun with this uh, this ride. It's really, uh, yeah, your passport's probably gonna be stamped a couple of times, and you get to travel with this one. Anyway, uh, yeah. congratulations. I, I mean, I, I could, you know, I could talk about it for hours, but I really absolutely adore this film, and uh, looking forward to your third film and seeing Murder Party for the first time. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Absolutely.